Hi, I'm Barbara Visloschel. I'm from the Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering Department at Ohio State University. And I'm here today to talk to Murray Johnson from the University of Delaware about his career and adventures as an aerosol scientist. So Murray, our backgrounds are somewhat similar and somewhat different. And I was wondering if you could tell me how, um, what your background was coming up through education-wise. Sure. Actually, uh, I'm not an aerosol scientist by trade, I guess by training as a graduate student. As a graduate student, um, I studied analytical and physical chemistry, did uh, research in uh, high-resolution optical spectroscopy uh, with tunable lasers, uh, postdoc doing surface-enhanced Raman spectroscopy, so looking at solids and surfaces, but uh, uh, not aerosols. Um, and it's pretty interesting because over the years I've moved um, in, in different directions. So when I started out in my own career, um, uh, I was looking again at high resolution optical spectroscopy of molecules. Then we wanted to look at uh, molecules that didn't fluoresce. So we photoionized them to make ions. Uh, but then we wanted to know about the ions that we were detecting, so that led me to mass spectrometry, which is, uh, has been my major area of uh, research. And uh, maybe we can get into it in a little bit, but as a result of mass spectrometry, we started looking at aerosol particles. And uh, so it was sort of a circuitous route to get around to, uh, uh, to aerosol science. Um, but uh, aerosol science has been the focus of what we've been doing um, for the last 20, 25 years. So you said your original work sort of uh, led to some experiments that in essence made you fall down the hole of aerosol, the rabbit hole of aerosol science. So can you elaborate on that a little bit more? Sure. Um, so uh, we were doing some work, actually it was a graduate student of mine, Gary Kinsel, who's um, now actually chair at Southern Illinois University, but he was doing some work. We were trying to do liquid chromatography mass spectrometry and be able to detect non-volatile molecules. And so the idea is you have a liquid stream and you want to vaporize that into individual molecules that we would use a laser to ionize. But that experiment was so frustrating to us because the laser would pulse, we'd get no signal, no signal, no signal from pulses, and then all of a sudden a huge flash of mm -hmm. signal. And then no signal, pulse, 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 and then a huge flash. Ah, we're making particles. We don't want to make particles. We want to make molecules. And so, and we're randomly hitting these particles. So that's really our first um, attempt uh, at uh, doing or, or uh, foray into aerosol mass spectrometry. It wasn't what we wanted. Um, but then uh, shortly after that, <clears throat> a colleague of mine, Dan Murphy, came to me and said, hey, you know, It'd be great if we could do something, uh, a single particle analysis by um, uh, mass spectrometry. And so that was sort of eye-opening for me because these particles that were the bane of our existence now were mm -hmm. the focus and there are all of these great applications that we can do. So that's actually how we originally got into it. So you got into it by accident in some senses and then but it's clear that you went on to develop a lot of this technology that is now kind of a standard instrument in the suite of things that we use to um, probe what's going on in the atmosphere. Do you want to tell me a little bit more about sort of your contributions to that field? Sure. So, and it's been a progression over time, and it's also been a, a progression that is dependent upon uh, various technological advances mm -hmm. with electronics and such. Uh, and so we have to put all of this in context because um, sort of the progression of the way that we've gone uh, has depended upon uh, the electronics available to us. So originally the problem was, uh, you know, we were hitting these particles randomly, which is mm -hmm. something we really didn't want uh, to do those later on. Actually, that's something we took advantage of. Um, uh, but what Dan and I discussed was, all right, well, uh, what we can do is have a laser beam, a continuous laser beam. The particle comes down into the laser beam, mm -hmm. scatters light, and that tells us the particle is there, so we'll fire uh, the laser. <clears throat> and so that was sort of uh, then the idea of the initial instrument that we put together collaboratively with uh, Dan. It was um, done actually in our lab. Um, and um, uh, he was the one that sort of worked out uh, the electronics of the light scattering and uh, getting that to particle analysis. 
Um, at that point in time, we, uh, it, it was very important to have the right uh, laser as well, because if the laser had a huge time delay between when you saw the light scatter pulse and um, uh, the firing of the laser, uh, the particle would have moved too far at that point, and we didn't quite know the velocity, and so we wouldn't hit the particle. So it was very important to have an excimer laser that could fire within a microsecond of when um, uh, you saw that scatter pulse. And so that was the basis of that first instrument that we put together. It's a long time ago. We, uh, we put that together in 1990, mm -hmm. and um, we were collaborating uh, when I was at the University of Colorado. Um, I had decided to make a move to the University of Delaware. And in fact, um, we actually got that experiment going, I would say about two or three weeks before we were scheduled to move. And we were taking data up until the day before the moving truck came. And so we did all of that work in a few weeks and um, published a paper uh, from that. And so uh, that was uh, the very beginning there. So when you went to Delaware, you also met another person sort of in an unusual way that became pretty instrument or pretty important in your in your uh, further development, right? Yes. So you would think that as academicians and as faculty, we would be seeing each other in um, in venues uh, uh, at at the university. But in fact, um, uh, I. I uh, we had a, a young child at the time, and I was sitting in the baby pool of a local community pool mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, with my daughter. And um, uh, another individual came uh, with his daughter, happened to be Tony Wexler, mm -hmm. and uh, he had just started at the University of Delaware as well. And so we just exchanged pleasantries and very quickly realized we had a lot in common <laughs> and interests. And... Um, uh, you know, he had an aerosol modeling background. Uh, I was just getting into aerosol measurements. And so that was such a, a great combination. And we, uh, from that point, started to collaborate and uh, had a great run together uh, with them. We, um, I, I um, and uh, so what would I say there? Um, uh, in the early days, so look, when we first started with aerosol mass spectrometry and we were working um, uh, with this light scatter pulse uh, to detect the particles and then um, uh, analyze them, really the light scattering could only be done down to maybe a little bit under a, a micrometer uh, in particle size. But that was such a cool new technique. Uh, it was of great interest. At the time, if you look at mass spectrometry, detection limits were on the order of a picogram for what people were doing with various types of samples. A one micron particle has about a picogram of material. It's sort of, that's where the state of the art was. Uh, but when Tony and I started to work, um, uh, so this is where I started to learn more about atmospheric aerosols, which was his background with, uh, with the modeling, we realized, well, you know, a micrometer particles is not where we wanted to be. We really need to be down in the accumulation mode, particles um, you know, of one or a couple hundred nanometers in uh, diameter, maybe even under uh, into the ultrafine mode. And so we were trying to figure out what to do because at the time there wasn't the technology there to detect those particles by light scattering. We had to go to uh, a different approach. And the approach that we came up with was sort of revisiting what our group many years ago was doing with mm -hmm. liquid chromatography, mass spectrometry, and randomly hit particles. Because we realized at that point, we just have to randomly hit particles. That's the only way that that experiment was going to, to work. And so um, how can you increase the probability that that actually would happen? And so what we did is we got a laser that had a very high repetition rate. The idea is if we fired the laser uh, uh, at a high rate, and if we had a geometry that uh, promoted overlap between the particle beam and the laser beam. So we actually had the particle beam coming down, the laser beam coming up. Okay. Uh, so that uh, would improve uh, the possibility of um, uh, uh, hitting a particle. And also about the same time that really made this go was a discovery by uh, Peter McMurray's group um, uh, of aerodynamic lenses and using those to focus the particle beam very tightly. So we used um, sort of a version of uh, lenses to be size selective in our case, but the idea was still the same. Uh, you could use aerodynamics to get particles into a tight beam. 
you have a laser beam that's aligned with the particle beam, you fire the laser very quickly, and now even though only one out of 50 one, or, or whatever uh, laser pulses hit a particle, you were hitting enough particles per unit time to make the experiment work. And that was uh, our next iteration where we were able to get down into this accumulation mode uh, region and actually learn quite a bit about um, uh, particle composition in that size range. So when you and I started working together, sort of side by side at least with our Krams mm -hmm. grant, um, I know the focus was really much going down to the nano and trying to sample from flames and things like that. Yes. So that was sort of the next generation, right? And you had to adapt once more to a different kind of technique. Yes, that's, a, that's exactly right. So again, um, you know, when we started to collaborate, actually, if you follow mass spectrometry, at that point, mass spectrometry <coughs> had detection limits in the femtogram range, mm -hmm. 100 nanometer particles about a femtogram. We were sort of uh, just pulling technology down to that um, uh, lower level. But as we started collaborating with you, uh, with Hai Wang, uh, uh, and uh, uh, Doug Dorn and Tony Wexler in that. I think I have everybody there <laughs> yeah. in that uh, uh, grant. We wanted to get down much lower than that. We wanted to get down under 50 nanometers, uh, down to uh, as low as 10 nanometers actually was our practical limit that we would look at at that mm -hmm. point, which you can still say is a little bit high, but that's uh, where we wanted to be. Uh, we thought, we'd... and so we had to go to a different technology uh, there. And so, uh, at that point, uh, the problems become very different. You can't use aerodynamics anymore to focus your particles. They start to get too small. Mm -hmm. And so we, the idea was there, okay, well, we have to use electrodynamics. If we put a charge on the particles, we can steer them. Um, and that almost becomes like uh, biological mass spectrometry where you have a large ion, say a protein or a DNA fragment, that you're sending into your mass spectrometer, well, those are similar to right, you know, five to 10. Yeah, BSA 20, is like yeah. eight nanometers. Or right, something. right, right. In fact, we've done single particle analysis of BSA using our, um, our mass spectrometer. And so, um, so we started to work um, uh, toward that. So what are the problems there? You have to use electrodynamics now to bring your particles in. And we also actually also had a, a, a particle trap where those charged particles were trapped. And so, a part, so the particle could be steered in and then actually trapped and just be sitting there waiting for analysis at the right time. Then you think, all right, how are we going to do the analysis? There's so little matter. If we're down at 10 nanometers, we only have an atogram of material now, an atogram. So that might be uh, somewhere in the order of 10,000 atoms, uh, depending upon what the composition right. of the particle is. And so we realized very uh, quickly there that if we were going to base it on sort of single particle analysis, we had to go to a different type of analysis. So what we were doing at the larger sizes was more a laser desorption ionization, um, uh, a laser pulse that was energetic to um, remove, to, to form uh, uh, molecular fragments and ionize them. Uh, but that wasn't going to work down at a small size. Uh, the other thing that we wanted to do was to be more quantitative. The laser desorption ionization was not particularly quantitative because you have these matrix effects, which uh, molecular fragments get the charge and which don't, mm -hmm. uh, which is a problem to this day uh, uh, with that technique. So we knew that to solve some of the problems that we want to work, wanted to work on with uh, you and Hai and others, we had to be quantitative with composition. So it was a completely different strategy. Why don't we take now a really high laser pulse, uh, high energy laser pulse? And so what we do is form a plasma mm -hmm. uh, from the particles. And uh, in fact, this was demonstrated by Bill Rings at what the time was uh, Bell Labs, mm -hmm. and then picked up by Mike Zachariah uh, at the University of Maryland, um, uh, who did some pioneering work with that uh, general approach. Uh, but the idea is basically that if you have a high enough laser pulse, you create a plasma. Your entire particle disintegrates to atoms, and you quantitatively convert your atoms to ions. Mm -hmm. So that is, if you're limited in the, in the amount of sample that you have, that's the only hope of doing that experiment well. And on top of it, it's quantitative because you know you're making ions out of all of your matter. And so that's what we did uh, uh, with that. that um, 
uh, led to sort of a third generation of single particle mass spectrometer, this nano aerosol mass spectrometer, which we've used quite a bit and still use uh, to these days. So it's been a progression from micron sized particles to hundreds of nanometers mm -hmm. to tens and 10 nanometers, uh, uh, which is where we are now. So where do you see the field going now? I mean, a lot of these instruments are now commercialized and you're a person who always sort of pushes the envelope. So right, what yeah. envelope are you pushing right now? <laughs> I have to say, um, and this is something that I've said many times, you know, uh, my background is chemistry, we're chemists. Um, and um, one of the things I like about aerosol science uh, is that it is a multidisciplinary field. There are a lot of engineers in it. Uh, and there are some really nicely engineered uh, instruments out there, mass spectrometers. And we haven't, uh, you know, we're chemists, we're not engineers. So mm -hmm. uh, our instruments may not look pretty, but we're always pushing the envelope uh, uh, in some way. And, and I think as a, uh, as a result of that, we really haven't taken the time to think about commercialization because then mm -hmm. that, that gets into engineering, which is not mm -hmm. our forte. Um, I think in the future, uh, well, look, um, uh, one would like to press down under 10 nanometers. As you know, there's, this, um, uh, issue, there's an issue of how particles are formed, how inception or nucleation, mm -hmm. whatever the mechanism is there, uh, but then at least atmospherically, how they grow uh, from, say, a nanometer or a couple nanometers up to tens of nanometers. You know, you have to turn on growth very quickly, right. otherwise those particles are just scavenged by pre-existing aerosol or, or fall or, apart or yeah. fall apart yes and uh, so if you don't have that rapid growth <clears throat> it doesn't occur <clears throat> so or, so then the question is how do those particles form and so to do that we have to be at least at 10 nanometers which is really at the edge of our analysis and maybe try to get under there to five nanometers and even a challenge from there is to get back to molecular analysis right because a lot of the growth is supposed to be organic materials. Uh, we know that it's carbonaceous matter from the elemental measurements we, we make, mm -hmm. but what are those molecular uh, materials? So, um, so at that point, it's no longer going to be single particle because you don't have enough molecules per particle mm -hmm. to do uh, uh, the analysis. And, um, uh, and in our case, I, it, look, it's, it's a very difficult problem. I think there'll be a lot of different approaches. There'll be some online approaches. The problem is whenever you do an online measurement, you have the advantage that it's, it's essentially a, a you know, real-time measurement, uh, uh, depending on the type of instrument. In situ measurement, there are real advantages mm -hmm. to that. But then there are also limitations because, mm -hmm. um, uh, at least in molecular analysis, there are also limitations. How, um, uh, how high a resolving power do you have if it's mass spectrometry? can you really narrow down what the range of uh, chemical species are there? And um, so for us in the future, I think uh, we're going to do this combination of elemental analysis and then collect particles and do molecular analysis, because then you have the full force, uh, so to speak, of um, uh, molecular mass spectrometry, molecular characterization mm -hmm. by other methods as well, as you'd have. So, Looking back over the end years, I can't remember. <laughs> Just say end, greater, uh, decades greater than yeah, one. You're yes. no longer, <laughs> no longer um, eligible for the Whitby Award yeah. for a number of years. <laughs> um, would you change anything about your path? Wow. Um, you know, the, uh, uh, the answer to that is no. Uh, the, the path uh, is a totally unpredictable, mm -hmm. predicted path that I've taken, right? Um, uh, I started out doing something very different than what I'm doing now. Um, it's been very important, uh, the people that I've met and collaborated with over the years, uh, particularly in the early days, initially uh, Dan Murphy and then Tony Wexler. I mean, mm -hmm. in, in, in a sense, that's using resources and serendipity around mm -hmm. you, right? I just happen to be in the same location mm -hmm. as Dan in the same location as Tony, the right place at the right time. And that really helped. And then after that professional um, uh, interactions that we had in our uh, the mm -hmm. joint grants, uh, a grant that we had for so many years and uh, other people uh, that have uh, really helped me. It's just sort of that progression and I, I, I really wouldn't change it. I don't see how it could be any different really because aerosol science is, is 
such this multifaceted, multidisciplinary field really to make advances. It involves people coming together with different backgrounds and doing something different, pushing the envelope okay. in a different way than we thought about before. So thanks for talking to me. Okay, great. Thanks. Appreciate it very much. <laughs> <laughs> We're done.